Okay, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, the title of my talk is Reflections on the Language of Explanation and Demography, Clarity or Confusion. And um, I thought since uh, it's approaching Christmas, we might do something a little bit different. Um, so I'm going to talk for a rather shorter time, I hope, um, than usual, and leave more time for discussion because there are questions that I pose but don't answer during this presentation. So let me give you a little bit of background first. Um, this year, as some people might know, is the 75th anniversary of the first publication of the journal Population Studies. And um, as on the 50th anniversary, the editors decided to produce a special issue, which was published on Tuesday this week. And they invited me to put in a paper on something like knowledge production um, for that special issue. And so I wrote a paper on uh, theory and explanation in demography. Um, and this is one section of that considerably longer paper. So it's just a small section from uh, a, a larger whole. The focus in the long paper, it's definitely on the quantitative literature and it's the discussion is grounded in the literature on fertility in Europe. And just for a general context, I pose the question, why is fertility currently low in Europe? In other words, how would we explain what we find about fertility levels in Europe? So that's the general framework of the longer paper. But in this paper, I want to talk particularly about language and the language that uh, demographers use when they're explaining things. So my first uh, argument is that language matters and it matters because it shapes how we think about the world. And I just want to take a few examples. So in politics, a lot of politicians recognize that language shapes how we think about the world and try and get us to think about the world in particular ways because of the language they use. So um, our current prime minister is a good example uh, who um, has these sound bites like build back better or yes, we're going to um, beat the virus and so on. Um, so the language he uses is to encourage people to think in certain ways. But in everyday life, this is true as well. And um, particularly we've seen recently uh, the episode at Yorkshire Cricket Club of um, uh, racial discrimination, um, the use of racial language, uh, derogatory racial language in the dressing rooms and so on. Um, language again being important and having not just the meaning of the word but other hidden meanings as well. Um, so the big example there would be the adoption of gay instead of homosexual in order to um, try and make people think more positively about homophobia and so on. So language shapes our everyday lives. And in demography, it's no less true. Um, and the uh, example that comes to mind there is the all the talk about demographic transition. We're inclined to think of first and second demographic transitions and what that involves, although that concept itself has been criticized for being Eurocentric, including by me. So the explanatory language used is often taken for granted in demography, but it's actually crucial for ensuring that we offer coherent explanations. So it's needed for explanatory success. So that's why I decided to look at the language of explanation in demography a little bit more uh, thoroughly. So as Hill said, my longer paper argues that we're very good in demography at measurement and modeling. And these have become the staples of demographic analysis and precision is definitely valued here. So demographers frequently query the accuracy of their data. There's lots of talk about, is this data accurate? What can we derive from it and so on? 
and almost all quantitative analysis note the limitations of their modeling. The aim is often to improve the measurement of their subject matter, the aim of demographers. And you can see this in fertility research in particular, where there have been a number of uh, adjustments to the commonly used total fertility rate. So for example, Bongartz and Sabotka offered us the uh, tempo and parity adjusted fertility rate. So more precise measurement, precision in measurement has become an, quite common in quantitative demography. But 25 years ago in that 50th anniversary uh, edition of population studies, John Hopcraft talking about fertility as well, concluded that we spend too much, too little time trying to explain and to understand rather than quantify and to describe. In other words, uh, we still needed 50, uh, 25 years ago to do more to advance the explanatory agenda, agenda within demography. And what I set out to do in the long paper is to uh, evaluate whether John Hobcraft's comments on demography would still stand 25 years on from him making them. So <laughs> is quantitative demography, in other words, still long on description and short on explanation? And I'm particularly interested in the fertility literature because I think that gives us a grounding for a more general discussion. So explanation, what is explanation? How do we explain? So if you look at uh, any of the philosophy literature, um, explanation is noted as complex and having many layers. And if we're going to be successful in explaining, these different layers must hang together in a way that is conceptually coherent. And that's really what I'm interested in, the conceptual coherence of the language that demographers use. So for example, Malms in a paper on social philosophy argues that we need to answer two types of question if we're going to be successful in explaining things. Uh, what the philosophers call the what questions and Malms calls constitutive explanation, but also the why questions, which Malms calls etiological explanation. And uh, I've argued elsewhere that um, this is a useful distinction, but that the what and the why are fundamentally connected. So we've got to know what we're trying to explain and why it came about. So in the most general terms, the purpose of explanation in social sciences is to render phenomenon such as low fertility intelligible. And achieving this, I argue, depends both on understanding the nature of the phenomenon in question and being able to account, uh, give an account of how it came about. Uh, one aside here is that uh, students often say when they're looking for a method, well, your method depends on the question you ask. And yes, it does. But the question you ask is often absolutely crucial because you've framed it already in terms of certain methods. So there's a chicken and egg here um, that is not so often recognized, certainly by students. So that, that's a general sort of uh, overview of what explanation involves. But how do fertility researchers use explanatory language? What kind of language do they use and how does that connect with the explanatory agenda? And you'll be familiar, very familiar if you're a fertility researcher with all these terms with a possible exception of the last one. So I'm going to look at pairs of terms. So drivers and determinants, almost every quantitative uh, paper on fertility analysis will mention either drivers or determinants or both. And then I want to look at mechanisms and pathways because these are two terms that uh, Demographers also use quite frequently, um, and some prefer mechanisms and others prefer pathways, as we'll see. But all these link to the fundamental nature of explanation in terms of causes and reasons. And this difference between causes and reasons is something I think that isn't well recognized 
in demography. And so I'll spend a little time talking about that. But let's look at the pairs. And I'm going to raise some questions and I'll put them up on the screen at the end in the hope that we can have a more general discussion. So drivers and determinants. And my big question here is, do you think the two terms are interchangeable or do they have distinct meanings? And that I find difficult to judge from the literature. Um, both are typically used to describe those factors found to be significantly associated with fertility and statistical models. Um, we sometimes find people talking about drivers, the drivers of low fertility are X, Y, and Z, or perhaps determinants. They appear to be understood mainly as synonymous by fertility researchers. Um, you can quibble with that if you like. Um, although I have a slight impression that drivers are preferred by those conducting cross-sectional analysis, and they're perhaps preferred because they're less causally loaded, a less causally loaded term than determinant. So I'm interested there in the relationship between the use of drivers and determinants and the thinking about causes. Here are some examples, again, from the fertility literature, which I think is quite important. So, first of all, uh, an example of a paper um, by uh, Hellstrand and colleagues um, on the decomposition of period fertility in Finland, quite a recent paper in 2020. And I've just taken two uh, quotes from that, a very short quotes. They say on page 11, right at the bottom, ultimate childlessness may become a strong driver of co co cohort fertility decline. So they use the word driver as a way of relating ultimate childlessness to fertility decline. But right at the top of page 12, so only a couple of sentences later, they say it's unclear what underlying factors or socioeconomic determinants are driving this fertility decline in Finland. So here they do seem to be making a distinction between drivers and determinants. So it appears that maybe they're thinking drivers are descriptive of proximate demographic factors and that determinants should be used in referring to underlying socioeconomic factors. However, that distinction is not at all evident in other usage. And we just need to look at uh, lots of different papers, but I've just chosen two. Um, and that's compare the way that Sobotka in a paper in 2017 uses the terms and Balbo and colleagues in 2013 used the terms in their review of fertility literature. So in his paper on post-transitional fertility, Sobotka identifies educational expansion that is an underlying factor, according to Hellstrand et al, as a key driver of postponed parenthood and thus presumably of low fertility. So we have Sobotka here referring to underlying factors as drivers. So that rather contradicts what a distinction Hellstrand et al might have been making. Whereas Bal Balboet and his colleagues organize their review of fertility research in advanced societies according to determinants of fertility, which include women's education. So we have women's education influencing fertility either as a driver according to Sabotka or a determinant according to Balbo and colleagues. And they identify all sorts of key determinants in the literature. Remember, this is a literature review, and they actually distinguish three uh, analytical levels, um, the macro level, and they mention, for example, economic trends being a macro level determinant of fertility, um, value and attitude changes being macro level determinant. But the meso level is things like social interaction and place of residence. And the micro level, they'd say fertility preferences and the gender division of labor. Um, the latter I'm a bit puzzled about as being a micro level factor, but uh, the one that really caught my eye was fertility preferences. Can we say that fertility preferences determine the fertility outcomes? Um, 
I'm not sure about that. Let's look a little bit more at what a determinant is um, in order to judge whether fertility preferences should be described as determinants. So by definition, a determinant is simply something that controls or affects something else. To ensure internal consistency, and this is the conceptual internal consistency that I think explanation requires, when seeking to explain low fertility, we need to think about how the numerous so-called determinants discussed in the literature might produce the outcome. So what is the connection exactly? In particular, we need to consider whether micro-level factors such as fertility preferences can really be said to determine fertility outcomes in the same way as macro-level factors like economic trends determine fertility outcomes. So are we using the correct language in both cases? Let's look at mechanisms and pathways, because one way of thinking about the role of determinants is to conceptualize them as part of a causal mechanism. And this is actually quite common language in uh, quantitative demography. Regarding studies showing earlier fertility among women in educational fields that are re related uh, more to the feminine fields of caring, as Balbo and colleagues uh, remark, they say the mechanism is that women either self-select themselves into educational paths that lead to jobs when they are, where they are more able to combine motherhood and employment, or the difficulty of combining career and children varies by chosen career type. Now, in both cases, they think a mechanism is operating and indeed uh, that the causal direction may be um, in doubt. So we're not sure whether one thing leads to the other or the other leads to the first thing. So what is a mechanism exactly? And does it imply a deterministic relationship? Um, I hope you like my picture of a clock here, um, which I found on the web. Uh, so talk of mechanisms suggests a deterministic relationship, which raises all sorts of philosophical questions when the subject matter is human behaviour, that is to say, fertility behaviour in this case. But if you think about a mechanism, you can think, well, a clock has a mechanism, and that consists of various parts functioning as a whole. But is this the kind of analogy that is good for social phenomena? Is that what we should be talking about, a mechanism like a clock mechanism? Or when demographers talk about mechanisms, do they mean something different? If it's a good analogy, if you think it's a good analogy, then we're really committed to explaining features of society in terms of the purposes they serve, not for individuals, but for the society as a whole. So uh, there are all sorts of precedents in sociology for thinking in this way, and we'll come to that in a minute. But the idea of functionalism um, has been a common idea within sociology for some time. But is this what demographers are talking about when they talk about mechanisms? So debates about, the, about functionalism and the existence of what are called social facts um, first identified by Durkheim, have occupied philosophers and sociologists for many decades. And I just note in the longer paper, we don't have similar debates in demography, which is kind of strange since demography is often housed in sociology departments. But at least in print, we don't see these active debates in demography. And then we have another philosophical problem, which I think comes into uh, contemporary demography. And that is the idea of holism versus the idea of methodological individualism. Now, alternative to conceptualizing society as functioning as a whole, that would be holism, is to argue that society is, is actually not more than the sum of its parts. Um, famous quote uh, by one Margaret Thatcher, uh, there is no such thing as society. 
and that macro level explanations, if we give them, are ultimately reducible to explanations about the behaviour of individuals. And this is called methodological individualism in the philosophy literature. So we've seen a lot of attention in the fertility uh, literature to individual decision making and fertility. And we have the influence here of um, Becker's home economics, for example, but also more recently of a psychology. Um, so they, uh, the psychology literature has been used by demographers to try and understand individual behaviour, fertility behaviour. So those who take seriously the centrality of individuals, women's and men's decision making and behaviour in the understanding of low fertility may hesitate to use terminology that suggests a deterministic or mechanistic relationship between the explanands, as the philosophers call it, that which is doing the explaining and the explanandum, that which is being explained. So we actually see in the literature a bit of confusion here, I think, with the use of uh, language that suggests a deterministic or mechanistic relationship, but a focus on individual behaviour and decision making regarding fertility. But then there's another term that several demographers use in the literature, which conceptualises something similar to mechanisms, and that's pathways. But there seems little consistency amongst demographers in how explanatory sequences are conceptualised. So let's look at how they use pathways, or who rather has used pathways, and in what context. Just a few examples very quickly. So in her study of lowest low fertility in Ukraine, Pirelli Harris does a mixed method analysis and she concludes that this shows that there's more than one pathway to lowest low fertility. So one way, one set of influences perhaps, leading to lowest low fertility. And Freika, um, taking a long-term cohort approach to the fertility transition, concludes that, quote, to date there have been four distinct pathways of fertility decline. So pathways seems to be a less mechanistic way of expressing the idea of a series of influences. Then you have Wood and colleagues who are economists referring to the pathways through which economic cycles affect fertility. Again, interested in the micro level as well as the macro level. And then you have a uh, Snufkowski um, and colleagues in 2016 using the same ter ter terminology, but in a very highly uh, structured uh, analysis using structural equation models of the pathways, as they call them, between education and fertility. So these are examples of the use of pathways, and these authors don't tend to use the term mechanism. Before we can identify an appropriate strategy for explaining for, uh, low fertility then, I think we need to think about the nature of the links in any such pathways, or if we prefer the term mechanism, the nature of the links within a mechanism, but then we have to defend the use of the term, which seems to be more deterministic. So let's look at the basis of all sorts of distinctions within explanation in relation to causes and reasons. I'm claiming that many, probably most demographers, would suppose that in order to explain low fertility in Europe, we need to identify its causes. And I'm questioning that. Um, Balbo and colleagues note that some researchers give causal interpretations of cross-sectional findings, which is indeed a serious problem because we don't know the so-called direction of influence or causation. I want to add a more fundamental challenge to the search for causation by asking, and I'll uh, just ask the most extreme question, 
is it ever appropriate for fertility researchers to give, give in causal interpretations of their findings? Now compare that to my first bullet point when I say that most demographers would probably use the language of causation, but is that appropriate for fertility research? Let's look at that in a little bit more detail. In a paper which takes a, a biosocial approach to low fertility, Foster comments, makes this comment. In almost all cases, she says, the pathway between genes and behavior is far more complex than suggested by reference to a simple causal link. So she uses the term pathways and she's rejecting the term causal or at least the term a simple causal link and is complicated by the phenomenon of consciousness. So she thus draws attention to an issue about the explanation of human action that is very widely debated in the philosophical literature. This debate centers on arguments about the nature of human action and thus how it can appropriately be explained. And if you want a, a more or less accessible account, look at Doro and Sanders 2013, um, and you'll see some of the uh, arguments that go on within philosophy. Um, they actually uh, look at more oh, of the last 20, 30 years of this argument and how it's developed over time. So one of the big classics and the one that I um, studied as a student, uh, not in 1958, I, I hasten to say, um, is about human action as meaningful behavior. And this was a book which has become a real classic uh, by Peter Winch, first produced in 1958, uh, lots of subsequent volumes, um, called The Idea of a Social Science. And Winch argued in this book that human behavior is not to be explained as the effect of certain causes because causal explanations are only appropriate where conscious human action is not involved. So we can only talk about causes where there is no conscious human action or choice. This is Winch's argument. And just to make this clear, I took a very simple example. As it happened when I was writing this part of the paper, there had been a train accident up near Aberdeen. And so um, the explanation of this train accident was, might be, Heavy rain caused a landslip, which in turn caused several carriages to leave the tracks and roll down the embankment. Now that is an appropriate explanation, causal explanation, because there's no question of human uh, action here in this particular case, because it makes no sense to claim that the carriages chose to leave the rails. So we have a an explanation in outline there, we could add lots and lots of detail to that. Well, how heavy was the rain? How did it come to cause the landslip uh, and so on? And which carriages left the, the tracks and which rolled down the embankments? But the main point is that we cannot say that the carriages chose to leave the rails. Is that true in fertility studies? Human action is quite different because it can only be explained, according to Winch, by giving reasons, not causes, as to why an individual acted the way they did. So as soon as we get towards human behaviour and individual behaviour, we should, according to Winch, be talking about reasons, not causes. Take a fertility example just to clarify this point. We're talking about reasons. Suppose a woman that we're interviewing explains that the reason she's childless is because she's postponing childbearing because she first wants to establish her career. Now her explanation reveals all sorts of things, certain beliefs and desires, such as her wish to follow a career and her belief that having a child now would make this difficult. Contrast that to a causal explanation. Now suppose that this same woman has actually made up this story about postponing childbearing because she actually doesn't want to talk to the interviewer about the cancer treatment that has left her infertile. The cancer treatment then has caused her infertility, which in turn has the effect of making childbearing impossible, hence her childlessness. 
So we can talk about causes in this case because there's no conscious human action involved. So we find in the philosophy literature that the difference between reasons and causes becomes quite crucial because reasons and causes have different explanatory roles. And we can see that in the fertility example. And this leaves, I think, fertility researchers with a bit of a conundrum. For the majority of individuals and couples, fertility behavior or having a child, I would uh, prefer we didn't actually use the term fertility behavior, but we can look at that later. Um, for the majority of individuals, childbearing is a meaningful action explicable in terms of their motives, reasons, desires, beliefs. But if having a child is generally not the effect of co the causal sequence, um, it sometimes is, but only in the minority of cases, should demographers abandon their search for causes of low fertility and look instead for other kinds of explanations that deal with motives, reasons, desires, and beliefs? The debate about reasons and causes, I would argue, can't actually be avoided if we want explanations of low fertility to hang together. And I take a quote from Doro and Sanders here, whatever the truth of the matter, such debates demonstrate that it is of vital importance that we clarify our concepts of motivation, reasons, beliefs and explanations. So let me just draw a conclusion or a few conclusions. First of all, conceptual consistency, as well as the supporting empirical evidence, I would argue is vital for successful explanation. I would also argue that there remains some confusion in the use of explanatory language in the quantitative demographic literature that we need to address. One way of doing so would be to engage more with other disciplines and other disciplines apart from economics and more recently psychology, including the philosophy of social sciences. We need, I think, to develop an active discussion of explanatory concepts and strategies within demography and more widely within population research. In the meantime, my conclusion is that Hobcraft's criticism still stands because there remains a lot more groundwork to be done before we can actually advance the explanatory agenda in demography. So let me just uh, finish by sharing the questions that, oh, first of all, the reference, if you really want to look at the uh, wider context of this argument, you can see my paper published on Tuesday called Theory and Explanation Demography, the Case of Low Fertility in Europe, and that's in the special issue for the 75th anniversary of population studies. And this is just a reminder of the questions I posed in case um, anybody would like to offer their views on any of them. Thank you. <laughs>